Well guys, if you're watching this, that means you and I have officially made it through the year 2021. So happy new year. Let's make 2022 amazing. Stay positive, stay focused, take care of yourselves and your loved ones. As for me, I'm going to kick off the new year on my channel by taking a final look at the best movies last year had to offer. So let's wrap it all up with my top 10 favorite movies of 2021. Starting the list at number 10 is a film I did not expect to love as much as I did, The Power of the Dog. Now, I am not a big fan of westerns, but Jane Campion delivered something truly special here. The Power of the Dog is a psychological drama about a charismatic but unpleasant rancher played by Benedict Cumberbatch, who torments his brother, the brother's new wife, and her son. Of course, as the movie goes on, we find out that things aren't as simple as they seem, and you do need to have patience with this film. When I was watching it, at first I was a little bit confused what all the hype was about. I was really appreciating the filmmaking, the mood and the tone. It was clearly very well crafted. The score by Johnny Greenwood immediately stood out to me. It's one of my favorite scores of the year. But I'm someone who needs a story, some interesting characters, themes and ideas to really get into a film. And the power of the dog does not reveal itself right away. However, the second half of the film is where it really grabbed my attention and it's definitely one of those movies where the third act puts everything else into perspective. You realize what the slower opening was there for and you immediately know you want to rewatch the whole thing because you now have so much context for the story, including where it's headed, you just know it's going to be an entirely different experience experience on second viewing. The performances are fantastic. The story is really well crafted and complex. It's the type of film you want to discuss and dissect and the payoff is so worth it. I ended up really loving The Power of the Dog. It's shaping up to be a big awards contender and it's definitely one of the films I'm rooting for this awards season. At number nine, I have a film that deserved a lot better at the box office. The Last Duel. If you did not see this one on the big screen, I'm sorry, you missed out, but the good news is that you can and should watch it at home on your TV and it will still be great. Directed by Ridley Scott, The Last Duel is a medieval historical drama that reveals the story behind the last judicial duel fought in France, which happened on December 29th, 1386. The film unfolds from three different perspectives, culminating in one of the most gripping duels ever seen on screen. I've talked about this movie on my channel already, so if you've been watching my videos, you already know I adored it. But a rewatch at home without the big screen experience is what really solidified The Last Duel having a spot in my top 10. I loved the way each of the three perspectives filled in the gaps of the other ones, how seemingly small details made all the difference. I loved how the structure actually mattered and served a purpose with this particular story. I love the way it showed the difference between how a character perceived themselves versus how this character came off to others. And of course, regardless of the size of the screen you're watching it on, it's incredibly cinematic and intense, but still gritty, just the way I like my medieval films, with a really good balance of action, drama, and character work. Plus, the cast, Jodie Comer, Adam Driver, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, all arranging from really good to great in this movie, fitting their roles perfectly. I have a feeling it's going to be one of those movies people slowly catch up on, it will find its audience, and then there will be a lot of videos and posts about how this is such an underrated gem over the next few years. But for me, the Last Duel is easily one of the best films of 2021. Next up, at number 8, I have a film that features one of my favorite lead actor performances of the year, Pig, the anti-John Wick movie, as I like to describe it. I was not prepared for Nicolas Cage to stare into my soul and challenge my life choices here, 
but he did. On its surface, Pig sounds like it's setting up to be a revenge thriller. A reclusive truffle hunter's pig is stolen and he embarks on a quest to get the pig back. But instead of vigilante justice and action sequences, the movie is almost a healing experience that challenges you to pause and consider what you truly care about and how pain might have changed your worldview. Pig is actually a very introspective film. So much of it is about restoring inner peace. As for Nicolas Cage, he delivers one of his most restrained, subtle, and nuanced performances, and he is wonderful. There's this quiet intensity to his character that's incredibly powerful, and as I mentioned, there are moments where it really does feel like he's staring into your soul through the screen. At the same time, despite this movie having so much to do with processing pain and the long-term effects pain and grief can can have on people, it's not a depressing movie. I actually found it to be very hopeful and inspiring. Also, it looks absolutely gorgeous. The cinematography is stunning and along with the sound design really supports the emotional core of the film. I loved how subversive Pig was and how emotionally impactful it ended up being. It was so refreshing to see that after this revenge thriller setup, the main character's quest is not about payback. It's about restoring the peace that's been disturbed. Pig is a surprisingly powerful experience, and I loved every minute of it. At number 7, I have another wonderful film that crashed and burned at the box office, partly because it came out the same weekend as Spider-Man. I'm talking about Nightmare Alley. The master Guillermo del Toro gave us a stunning film noir, and we were not worthy. Based on a novel under the same name, Nightmare Alley is about a man, Stan, who takes a job at a carnival, learns how to be a mentalist, and aims for wealth and success in life, no matter what it takes. It's a dark, twisted tale of cold, blind ambition, and in true del Toro style, it incorporates horror elements while not actually being a traditional horror film. Something that's different about it, though, is that this is the director's first film without any supernatural elements elements involved. It's a true neo-noir. The way it looks, the type of story that it tells, the characters it features, including a striking femme fatale. If you love your films to be gorgeous but dark, exploring the unpleasant sides of humanity, Nightmare Alley is the film for you. It's a beautiful, seductive, sinister, mysterious, sexy noir drama, and I absolutely adored it. I will say you definitely feel the runtime because of the pacing, but for me, this was actually a good thing. I just wanted to stay in this atmosphere and this gorgeous 40s aesthetic for as long as possible. This movie could have gone on for another hour and I wouldn't have complained especially with this amazing cast. Bradley Cooper, Rooney Mara, Tony Collette, Kate Blanchett, Willem Dafoe, Richard Jenkins, but I can see why some people might feel that it's too slow. I can't wait to add this movie to my collection and keep re-watching it though. I've seen it twice already and I just can't get enough of it. For my number six, I'm going with a movie that I am not sure if people outside of the film festival crowd saw or heard heard of at all, and that is a shame because it is really great. Flea, the animated documentary that I really think you should make an effort to watch. Flea follows Amin, a refugee telling the story of his journey from Afghanistan to Denmark. He is not comfortable revealing his identity, which is why the documentary is mostly animated with a small amount of historical footage inserted, and this is the first time he shares his very powerful personal story. The film is outstanding, and I can't possibly imagine anyone walking away from this without being emotionally impacted. Some of it is, of course, heartbreaking, and it does get dark, but overall, this is a very inspiring documentary that is a testament to determination and human spirit. 
All I wanted as I was watching it is for this guy to succeed and just be happy for the rest of his life. The style of animation they went with really worked for me as well, even though it's pretty minimalistic, it lets the storytelling be front and center and it feels very fitting. The story itself is absolutely incredible and very moving. I saw it for the first time at Sundance at the beginning of the year and it really stuck with me all this time. And that's saying something because as you guys know, I do not watch a lot of animated films, but this one I cannot recommend enough. At number five, I have my favorite horror film of the year that at one point I almost lost hope of watching because it just kept getting delayed over and over again. But obviously I did watch it. It's Saint Maud and it is Fantastic. Saint Maud is an excellent psychological horror film with a religious aspect to it. It's about a young nurse, Maud, who has a, let's say, very special relationship with God. When Maud begins taking care of a former dancer, she becomes obsessed with saving this woman's soul before she dies. Do not mistake this for just another woman unraveling due to her religious upbringing type of horror film. Film, Saint Maud is a lot more interesting and unique than that. It truly lives up to that psychological horror label. So much of this film digs deep into its lead character to reveal trauma, loneliness, and an attempt to make sense of her life and the world around her, which are the things that ultimately turn her towards her interpretation of religion. It's a haunting story with an unforgettable lead performance an unnerving score and stunning visuals. It's a film that's going to make you question what's real and what isn't, but will also leave you with a lot to think about, something that may initially seem pretty open to interpretation, but once all the puzzle pieces fall into place, the picture is actually very clear. Saint Maud is another film that has been haunting me since the beginning of the year, and I will keep recommending it any chance I get. I do have a separate review of it that has a non-spoiler and a spoiler section where I talk a lot about the film's themes, so if you haven't seen it yet, check that out. I will leave a link to that in the info box below along with any other reviews of the films I'm talking about today. Coming in at number four is a movie I absolutely loved Obviously, it's at number four, but I considered not including it on this list at all because even though it made the festival rounds and it has been released in some other countries, its US release isn't until February. But then I thought for me and for the awards, this is definitely a 2021 film and I might as well give you a movie to look forward to in the beginning of the year. So get ready for the worst person in the world because it is amazing. The worst person in the world is in fact not about a terrible person. It's a romantic comedy drama about a young woman trying to navigate her love life and vague career path. So much of it will ring true for anyone who's ever turned 30 in general and for millennials in particular. This film really blew me away. I heard it was good. I heard heard great feedback from film festivals, but I was not expecting this to be one of the standouts of the year for me. It has a lightness to it that's fun and entertaining, but it can also occasionally hit you like a ton of bricks. Joachim Trier, who directed and co-wrote this film, just gets it. He understands his audience and their struggles exactly as they are. It's honestly satisfying and painful to watch at the same time. The worst person in the world is a very easy film to recommend. I am oddly tempted to describe it as a crowd pleaser. It has its melancholic moments. It has its contemplative moments. It might occasionally make you feel sad or frustrated, but ultimately it will also make you laugh. It puts a smile on your face and it resembles life. That's the best way I can describe it. It's a beautiful film. I can't wait for you guys to be able to watch this one. Don't miss out on it. I promise it will be worth your time. Personally, 
I can't wait to be able to see it again. We are in the top three now, and opening that top three is a film that gets my I wasn't prepared for this many emotions award of the year, and that is Come On, Come On. If we're talking about the most emotional movie experience of 2021 for me, this is definitely it. Movies like Come On, Come On don't come along too often. It takes a very special group of people to create a film that feels this warm, genuine, and empathetic. The story is about Johnny, a radio journalist going around the country interviewing young people who gets thrown into a crash course on parenting as due to some unexpected circumstances, he has to take care of his nine-year-old nephew, Jesse. Through exploring this relationship, the writer-director Mike Mills not only takes a closer look at the relationship between kids and adults, but also at the importance of listening to one another. Come On, Come On is a film about compassion and understanding, a film about two very different characters learning through caring for each other. It's about bridging the gap between generations and how important our ability to communicate and listen to one another is for our future. It's a beautiful film that feels intimate and personal, and a big part of that is the amazing chemistry between the leads, Joaquin Phoenix and Woody Norman. The two are perfect together. Their relationship feels so genuine, and I absolutely cannot wrap my mind around how most of the awards have ignored them. And on top of it all, this film is shot in stunning black and white, featuring some of my favorite cinematography of the year. Come On, Come On exceeded every expectation I had and stole my heart. There's so much I want to tell you about it, but I also want you to go on this roller coaster of emotions on your own. So you're just going to have to take my word for it. Come On, Come On is that great. At number two, the runner-up to my favorite film of the year is, of course, Denis Villeneuve's Dune, my most anticipated film of the past few years, and I was not disappointed. It was everything I hoped it would be. Based on roughly half of Frank Herbert's classic sci-fi novel, Dune Part 1 truly deserves to be described as epic. Steeped in lore, philosophy, and and politics, the film explores a science fiction universe unlike any other. This story has feuding great houses, interstellar travel, betrayal, manipulation, clash of cultures, extraordinary abilities, prophecies, and all of this is presented with the incredible scale and scope Dune deserves. As a big fan of the novel and a huge fan of Denis Villeneuve's work, I was a bit worried I was going going to overhype myself for this film, but it delivered everything I was hoping for, from the breathtaking otherworldly visuals to the immersive Hans Zimmer score and the spot-on performances from the entire cast. It's a cinematic spectacle unlike any other and a real joy to watch for any sci-fi fan. I was completely blown away by seeing the fascinating world of Dune brought to life on screen. It's a world that's rich and complex, full of textures and depth that give it a powerful sense of place and realism, and to see a blockbuster that's able to merge scope and substance the way this film does is just unreal. I have watched Dune twice in theaters and one more time at home, and I have loved it more and more with every viewing. Can't wait to watch it yet again, can't wait for part two, which will hopefully be out next year, this film is amazing. And finally, at number one, the only narrative feature film that I gave a 10 out of 10 to this year, and that film is The Green Knight. To say that I loved The Green Knight is an understatement. I will go as far as saying that this is now one of my favorite fantasy films, of all time. I was floored by this movie, particularly considering that Arthurian legends have been adapted for the big screen so many times. 
But here, the director, David Lowry, not only takes on a story that hasn't been retold too often, but also infuses it with creativity and shows modern audiences what medieval fantasy films can and should be. Sir Gawain, the protagonist of The Green Knight, is a very reluctant hero. His journey isn't about bravely slaying his enemies and saving those in need. It's actually about him finding that hero within himself. It's a quest of honor as much as it is a quest for maturity. And if you're someone like me who looks for character growth in storytelling, this film will not let you down. Thematically rich and visually stunning, The Green Knight manages to stay pretty faithful to the original medieval poem while also feeling fresh and modern. It's a morality tale steeped in the conflict between civilization and nature, the human urge to control destiny faced with the inevitable, and the clash between Christianity and paganism. It's also an absolute feast for the eyes as every shot looks like it should be framed and praised as a work of art. And in true A24 fashion, all of this culminates in an ending that's going to leave you thinking about what it all means for a while just the way I like it. I am completely in love with this film. There is nothing I would want to change about it. The Green Knight is absolutely spellbinding and deserves to be praised as one of the best fantasy films ever made. And that's it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what your top 10 movies of 2021 are in the comments below. I would love to know. Thank you so much for watching this video. As always, a big thank you to all my patrons for supporting me on Patreon with an extra special thank you to the patrons whose names are on the screen right now. But I hope all of you are having a wonderful day and a wonderful start of the year. I will see you very soon in my next video. Sampaka! <laughs>